David Williams with Jesus Ministries. Thanks for tuning in. We're going to be talking about can a believer in Christ lose the inheritance of salvation that Jesus purchased for him? Now, I said in a previous video that one of the confusing points about this topic is the language. Now, we believe that the moment you confess Jesus as your Lord and Savior and you're baptized into him, you are baptized into his death and resurrection. We'll get into that in a second. And at that moment, your eternal life begins right then because you are, as Jesus said, going to pass from this life right into a higher dimension of life. You're going to pass from this life into another level of life. First of all, you passed from death, dead in sin, to life in Christ when you confessed him as your savior and were baptized into his death and resurrection. But let's let's look at this. Uh, why is it such a an, an issue? First and foremost, let's actually examine the words of Jesus Christ himself so as not to live in a confused way because the less we the more we pay attention to Jesus the the the, the clearer we'll understand things now we're in the the gospel of Matthew and let's look at verse at uh, chapter 7 at chapter 7 good chapter uh, Jesus starts here in verse 13, enter you in at the straight gate, meaning the, the tight gate. It's a tight squeeze to enter this. It's tight. Enter you in at the straight gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leads to destruction. And many there be which go in thereat. Most people are entering into the broad area. The narrow area, few are going to find it. Verse 14, because straight is the gate and narrow is the way which leads unto life and few there be that find it. Let's keep reading here. Beware of false prophets which come to you in sheep's clothing, but internally they're vicious wolves. You shall know them by what they produce. So what I produce indicates what I am, not what I say that I am, not what I emotionally feel myself to be. If my inside doesn't dictate my outside, then it's because I'm a hypocrite or I'm a liar. We'll get into that. It says in verse 16, you shall know them by their fruits. Do men gather grapes from thorns or figs from sharp plants called thistles? Even so, every good tree brings forth good fruit. It's really simple. It's really simple as far as a believer. A believer will bring forth good fruit. If you are bringing forth bad fruit, it's because you're not a believer, according to what Jesus said. Now, I'm just saying that based on what Jesus said here. Okay? Verse 17, even so, every good tree brings forth good fruit. That's a fact. But a corrupt tree brings forth evil fruit. A good tree cannot bring forth evil fruit, neither can a corrupt tree bring forth good fruit. Every tree that brings not forth good fruit is cut down. Now, we know that a tree, once it's grown, it's, it's there. You plant a tree, it's there. Let's look at that planting of the tree as your confession of faith. You believe in Jesus. He convicts you of your sin. You realize you're a sinner. You start to follow him. You believe. You get baptized. You repent of your sins. You make a decision that your lifestyle in the flesh is wrong. You start, you're going to follow Jesus now. You get baptized out of obedience to the accepting Jesus process. Okay? Believe and be baptized. According to what Jesus said, believe and be baptized. I believe. I, re I repent. Believe. I'm baptized into that faith. I'm baptized into the death of Christ. Okay? I believe and I'm baptized. And this is saying right here that if I don't bring forth good fruit, God will cut me down. 
even though I am a tree. If I don't bring forth good fruit, I will be cut down and thrown into the fire. That is a direct illustration of the lake of fire, hell. So if my faith is not producing good fruit, I will be cut down and thrown into the fire. And obviously, it's because my faith either A, was non-existent from the beginning, or B, failed. Because faith does, you know, people, uh, faith doesn't fail. People do fail to the point where they don't repent. Let's keep reading here. Verse 20, wherefore, by their fruits, you will know them. Verse 21, not everyone that says unto me, Lord, Lord, will enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that does the will. So you're not saved by your works, but your works prove you are faithful. It gives credence to the fact you've repented. It is what John would describe it, John the Baptist, not John the Apostle, not John the follower of Jesus. What John would describe it as is faith, it, uh, is uh, bring forth fruit. He described it as Jesus did, actually. Fruit meet for repentance. Bring forth fruit that is evidence of repentance. Bring forth fruit that proves you repented. Bring forth behavior that is evidence of your repentance. If I don't, then I'm not going to be saved from my sins. Let's keep reading here. Not everyone that says unto me, Lord, Lord, will enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that does the will of my Father. You've got to do the will of the Father. Many will say unto me in that day, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name? That's, that's a work right there. Uh, and in your name have cast out devils, and in your name done wonderful works. So they were able to prophesy in his name, in the name of Jesus. They were able to, to uh, cast out devils in his name. Do wonderful work in his name. He says, but if you work sinfulness, none of your good will be regarded for eternal life. Now, I don't earn eternal life. But eternal life fills the heart of the person who's faithful. And he begins to act out the fact that he's en route to eternal life. He begins to live out the fact that he will spend eternity with God. Here on earth, he will bring forth fruit that is evidence that he's decided to turn from his sins. When I decide that I'll turn from my sins, I've got to be baptized into the death and resurrection of Christ. That's exactly what water baptism represents. You to say that I've got to be born of the water and of the spirit or else I'm not acceptable to the Father. Let's keep reading here. Verse 22. Many will say unto me in that day, Lord, we read that. Uh, verse 23, I will profess to those who do iniquity, I never knew you. Depart from me, you that work iniquity. Therefore, and isn't it ironic that people who say that once you believe in your heart once, that it doesn't matter what you do from that point on, you're going to be saved. Isn't it ironic that people can say that, but yet uh, they believe that it takes confession at least repentance to come to God, but they don't believe that you can renege on that repentance and walk away from God. They believe at least that I've got to believe on God, but they don't believe that I can stop believing in God because they're essentially saying, well, it's not of your works that you're saved. Well, if it's not of my works that I'm saved, then it should never be of my works that I'm not saved so I can murder as many people as I want and spend eternity with the Lord. Because it wasn't my works that saved me initially. So it shouldn't be my works that keep me, right? Well, let's not focus on that too much. But what we're talking about when we're saying that works don't save you is it's not your efforts that guarantee you eternal life. It is Jesus who guarantees eternal life to the faithful. Jesus guarantees eternal life to the faithful because your behavior outside of faithful, your behavior outside of inner obedience to God and outward obedience to God, your behavior outside of that, if you try to walk old ladies across the street or go out and preach or go out and pray for people, but if your heart is not set, if you're not doing it from a heart that has been changed by the Lord, 
like the sons of Sceva, for instance. The sons of Sceva went out and tried to cast out devils in Acts chapter 19. The sons of Sceva, Sceva, who was a Jew, had seven sons. They went out, tried to command demons to leave people, but yet they were not saved in that they were not faithful to the Lord. They had no declaration of faith in God. They had no trust in God themselves. They tried to do what Paul was doing, and the demons viciously attacked them through this individual. And when these demons attacked them, they ran out of the house naked and scarred. And so you can't just do the works of the Lord. You have to first repent, believe the gospel, and get baptized into Christ. If you're going to live for the Lord, you've got to obey the Lord. And if you don't obey the Lord, you're not going to inherit eternal life. Listen to this. It says in verse 24, Therefore, whosoever hears these sayings of mine, i got to hear it, and does them, I will liken him to a wise man. So I've got to hear and do, and I'll be wise. If I don't hear and do, I won't be wise. James says, be not hearers only, but doers. We'll get into that in a second. He says that in verse 24, whosoever hears these words of, of these sayings of mine and does them, I will compare him unto a wise man which built his house upon a rock. The rain descended, the floods came, the winds blew, beat upon that house. It didn't fall, for it was built on a rock. He that hears these, listen, listen, listen. He that hears these sayings of mine and does them not, I will compare him to a foolish man which built his house on unsteady sand. The rains came down, the floods came, the winds blew, beat upon that house, and it fell, and great was the fall of it. What's he talking about here? I've got to hear the word of God, and I've got to respond in order to be strong and withstand the test of time, in order to inherit what the Lord already purchased for me. He already purchased it for me. I'm just living like I want it. I've got to live like I want it. If I live like I don't want it, then he will take it from me. Let's go further here. Let's look here in Matthew chapter 13. Jesus gives some illustrations of salvation, some illustrations of the life of faith, the lives of those who were, who were to be affected by faith. Here in uh, chapter 13, uh, jumping down to verse 18, Jesus gives a parable or a story that had a meaning, an example. Okay, in verse 18, Matthew 3, 18, he, uh, Hear you therefore the parable of the sower, the planter. When anyone hears the word of the kingdom and doesn't understand it, then comes the wicked one and catches away that which was planted in his heart. This is he which received seed by the sidewalk. He gave an analogy of four types of ground that were all planted on. One type of ground was concrete sidewalk or stone sidewalk. Another kind of ground were it was shallow. It had dirt there, but it also had stones there. Another kind of ground was it was soil. It was soil, but there were thorns with. Uh, within the soil. There were thorns growing there in the soil. And another, and the fourth kind of ground was just pure soil. So he describes the first one as a, as a person who just didn't understand it. And before the person could meditate on it, the devil came and through some situation stole that word. The individual forgot it, didn't receive it, walked away. This is he which received seed by the sidewalk. Verse 20. But he that received seed in, into stony places, this is the shallow ground here, the same as he that hears the word and anon uh, with joy receives it. This is what we would consider believing in God, initial belief in God. This is the initial phase of belief in God. You hear it, you accept it. And this guy accepted it with joy. These individuals accept it with joy. Verse 21, it's not, it doesn't go deep enough. Because the question we're answering in this video is, can I lose my place of eternal life once I said I want it, once I accepted it? He says, he that has not root, uh, uh, verse 21, yet has he not rooted himself, but doors for a while. I'm enduring for a while. I'm doing okay. I am walking faithfully with God for a while. 
For when tribulation or persecution arises because of the word by and by, he is offended. That means I've given up the faith. If I give up the faith, then I frustrate the grace, according to what Paul said. We do not frustrate the grace of God. I give up the faith if I don't. If, if I get offended, I give up the faith, just like John the Baptist was prepared to do. Uh, uh, in Matthew 11, he asked the Lord, are you the one that should come or should I look for another? Jesus said, blessed are those who are not offended in me. Jesus described John the Baptist's consideration of looking for somebody other than Jesus as offense. So this definition of offense is when we leave Jesus and start looking for another route of help and salvation. If I leave Jesus, that's called being disloyal, unfaithful. I cannot receive eternal life if I do that. Uh, even if I endure for a while, even if a while is 20, 30 years, I endure for a while. If I'm offended and I lose my faith in the Lord, I will lose what faith procures or attracts to me, which is eternal life. So you can lose eternal life if you give up the faith. Verse 22, he also that received seed among the thorns is he that hears the word and the care of this world and the deceitfulness of riches choke the word and he becomes unfruitful. This is the person who hears the word of God. It actually goes into his heart. But because he's got some doubt, he's got some 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 deceptive desires, he's got an ambition for money, he's got an ambition for an education, even if it causes him to lose his faith, he's got bills here, he's got wealth he wants to obtain over there, he's got relationships he's seeking, he's got all of these businesses he wants to start, he's got places he wants to visit, and following God is not a priority, even though he believes in God and he accepts the gospel in his heart. He hasn't accepted it entirely. He hasn't repented. He hasn't turned from his selfish ambitions. They choke the word and he becomes unfruitful. Uh, Jesus described this seed that was planted in him as growing, but it grew among other things that were in his life. And so the first three kinds, the first kind you would not consider to be a person who believed, the second the, the two after that, these are people who received the word of God and were doing okay for a season, but the sinfulness of their hearts got the best of them, and they die in their sins. Depart from me, you that work iniquity. If I work iniquity without turning from it, I can't receive what Jesus purchased for me. The last kind of ground is he that received the seed into good ground, verse 23, and he hears the word and understands it, which also bears fruit. If I am not bearing fruit, it's because I am not saved. Let's look at verse 24 here. Jesus gives another parable about uh, weeds and wheat, tares and wheat. He says the kingdom of heaven is like, in verse 24, the kingdom of heaven is likened unto a man which sowed good seed in his field, 25. But while men slept, his enemy came and sowed tares among the wheat and went his way. But when the blade was sprung up and brought forth fruit, then appeared the tares also. So as the wheat, as the wheat began, as the grain began to grow, then the weeds began to grow with it. And the servants couldn't tell the difference, but they wanted, but they, they, they knew that there were weeds. There were some weeds that they were, they were obvious about. They said, let's pull it up. The, the, the boss, the landlord, the owner of the field said, don't do it. Otherwise, you might pull up the wheat, the good things. You'll pull that up as well. And so he said, let them both go together. When it's harvest time, what's the significance of harvest time? you'll be able to clearly distinguish between the wheat and the tares. They'll look so different by their works, so different by their behavior, so different by their actions, then you'll be able to distinguish. Then my servants will be able to distinguish the one from the other. He explains this just in case we don't understand what this is in verse 37. He answered and said unto them, Here... He, uh, he that sows the seed or plants the seed is the son of man, describing Jesus Christ, describing himself. The field is the world. The good seed are the children of the kingdom. The tares are the children of the wicked one. 
The enemy that sowed them is the devil. The harvest is the end of the world. The reapers, his actual servants he was speaking with, are the angels. As therefore the tares or the, or the weeds are gathered and burned in the fire, so will it be in the end of this world. The Son of Man will send forth his angels, listen to this, and, and they shall gather out of his kingdom all things that offend. We got, we're going back to that word offense now. They will gather out of his kingdom all things that offend and, and them which do iniquity. If I live a life of sin, regardless of what I'm emotionally feeling, mentally thinking, I will be gathered out of the earth. When New Jerusalem returns, then he's going to snatch me out of the planet if I survive the tribulation. He's going to snatch me out of the planet. Verse 42, and they shall cast them into a furnace of fire. There will be wailing and gnashing of teeth. Okay, let's, uh, let's read another parable as it relates to, in, in reference to, can a person who's accepted the faith and has eternal life to look forward to, can they lose that if they turn away? Let's look at this here. Uh, we are in the same chapter. We want to look at when he talks about, the, uh, look, verse 47, look at this. 47, again, the kingdom of heaven is like unto a net that was cast into the sea. So now he's talking about a fisherman. He's saying the kingdom of heaven, why does he use this phrase, the kingdom of heaven? He's describing this phrase, he's using this phrase to describe those that are on the earth that live by the will of the king of heaven. Those who are living under the jurisdiction, under the government of heaven. That's the kingdom. The government style in heaven is a kingdom. And he brings that government style on earth by the people that are on the earth that believe in him and do what he wants them to do. The kingdom of heaven is like unto a net that was cast into the sea and gathered of every kind. This is what the gospel does. It goes out into the world and it gathers of every kind into the kingdom of heaven. There is a world and then there's a kingdom of heaven within the world that Jesus began, that Jesus set up, that Jesus established. And he says that the net is as it, it which represents the ministry of evangelism. It goes into the sea. It gathers from the sea, all these types of fish. There are fish that remain in the sea. Those represent the people that never came to the Lord. They remain in the sea. And then there are those, many are called, few are actually chosen. There are those that are called out of the world and actually begin the journey from the world into the boat of the Lord. The Lord is a fisherman. He throws out his net, he gets these fish, he takes them from among the sinners that are in the world, verse 47, he's gathered of every kind, verse 48, which when it was, when it was full, they drew it to shore, they drew it to the sand, and sat down, listen to this, we're asking, we're answering the question, can a person lose their opportunity for salvation, can they lose salvation? Once they accept the gospel, of course they can. If, af if after they accept the gospel, they deny it with their behavior. Look at what he says here. Verse 48. When it was full, they drew it to shore, sat down, gathered the good into the vessels, into their baskets, into their receptacles, their buckets. They they they. The evangelism, the gospel goes out into the world, people come in. And from that, God distinguishes who he can keep and who he cannot. Same with Judas. Judas, I want you to follow me. Judas had the destiny to betray the Lord. So he chose Jesus, Jesus chose Judas so that Judas could fulfill his destiny. Peter said that very clearly in Acts chapter 1. Peter, Judas died in sin so that he could go to his own place. His place was hell. So, what we need to grasp is what Jesus teaches, not what theological teachers teach. You can lose eternal life if you do iniquity. 
Only those who are faithful unto the end are going to be saved. You have to endure to the end, you'll be saved. We'll get into some more of this at a later date. Uh, but just to conclude these video series, this video series on baptism and eternal security, it is untrue that you don't have to be baptized to be saved. In order to be saved, you've got to be born of the water and of the Spirit. Jesus said that in John 3. Only if you're born of the water and of the Spirit can you inherit the eternal life that God purchased for you through His Son, Jesus. Secondly, is it true that once you're saved, or once you confess Jesus and receive Him in your heart, that it doesn't matter what you do, that you'll always be saved? You can only always be saved if you always live by faith. Only those who endure to the end are going to be saved. God is going to judge you by your works. He's going to judge you by your words. By your words will you be justified, and by your words will you be condemned. He will judge you by what comes out of your heart, because what comes out of your heart is either going to justify or condemn you. How can you be justified? Because Jesus says, follow me and I will make you a fisher of man. Follow me and you'll be my disciple. We'll get into more of this later, but if you turn from the faith, you will forfeit your inheritance of salvation. And if you're not baptized into Christ, you're not baptized into his death, you're yet in your sins. Paul talked about that in 1 Corinthians 15. Check that out and we'll be uh, getting back with you on these topics and others in the future.